What does it actually have stored right now? Throw away the All these things that I checked, it can throw away. In fact, they are thrown away. They're off the stack. Bye-bye. The only thing that's remaining on the stack right now, when it goes back to do this and this, is this guy and this guy from the first call, and this one and this one from the second call of the second recursion. And now it goes down again deeply and deeply again. And sooner or later, it checks this off. And it knows, I finished my first recursive call. There is really a way to get from here to here in half the, the place. And then it no longer needs this or this or any of these. And it goes back to just storing two things. The point is, what it really ends up doing at any point storage-wise is storing a configuration for every halfway spot in between. And when it finally finishes that one little section that it's doing, it pops back up, erases those things, and goes down to another section. And the maximum number of configurations on the stack at any time is the number of configurations it takes to have this over and over again until you're down to a configuration difference of 1. And that's exactly the log of the distance from here to here. And that gives you something more or less S of n. Right? So that's, that's the analysis of the space of this. The analysis of this space actually has nothing to do with complexity theory. It's just an algorithms problem. And it's understanding recursion and stacks. This is really a good question for what's going on in Scheme if you did this algorithm, that the stack doesn't overflow. That it's the time that would slow this down, but the stack would never overflow until you ran out of memory. All right, um, I'm kind of relying in this last step a little on your intuition about how recursion works and how stacks work. So if you're a little weak on that, there's gonna, you're going to have some trouble understanding what I just said a few minutes ago with this idea. But, but let me stop. Maybe I can explain it in a different way. Let me answer questions first. Yeah, Doug? I'm just remembering there were times doing recursion where we uh, like would have a stack overflow error. And I'm remembering trying to kind of compare with why, why is this one specifically not overflowing? It seems that... This doesn't overflow because you're cutting down this parameter by half every time. Right. So the stack, how many active procedures does the stack ever have on its list at any time? It's got the original. It's got this one. It's got, it's got another half, another half, and then it's got one. And when it succeeds in that one, it pops it off and puts a new one on. And when it succeeds in that, it pops it off, puts a new one on. Sooner or later, it'll get down to here. But then all the activations for this have been popped off already. So it never has both of these on the stack at the same time. It finishes with this one before it gets to this one. So the number of actual procedures that it has active in memory at any time that it has to remember to get back to is the number it takes to take m, have it down until it gets to 1, which is the log base 2 of m. Does that make sense? Yeah. Michael? If, yeah. if the time is so awful here, why doesn't it move up to the exponential time ring? Why does it get to stay in T space? Michael asked a good question that, that really does merit a good answer. <laughs> Let's see if I can give you one. I just showed you that if you have an algorithm in NP space, that I could simulate it and keep it in P space. So that NP space, even though it contains P space, actually equals P space. And you notice that this simulation actually takes exponential time. So everything you notice is true. I also just showed you that if you have something in NP space, I'll write it out here. This is a little bit of an unfair picture. Here's NP space. This is our first picture before I showed you that P space can simulate NP space. NP space is certainly bigger than it's certainly bigger than P space because it's P space with non-determinism. Right? So it's certainly at least outside. And I just showed you that it was equal, because P space can simulate it. And you're asking me, well, isn't it true that exponential time can also simulate it? And the answer is yes, it can. NP space is certainly inside exponential time. And I didn't mention that, but it's true in our discussion that exponential time sits outside these two. So that's all it really says. Um, that's not as clear as the answer I gave you, maybe, huh? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> now you're confused. <laughs> um, I guess the answer to your question is that there's no issue there. It, it, what you said is right. It's true that exponential time can simulate non-deterministic space. Yeah. What? We know that exponential time is bigger than polynomial time, but we don't know that p space is bigger than polynomial time, right? So we don't actually know that this is exponential, given that. We know that we don't know that this has to be exponential. Right. We don't know that. I, I know that I can simulate NP space with exponential time, that NP space is contained inside exponential time, that I'll never need worse than exponential time to do it. But for all I know, there might be a faster way to simulate NP space. I might be able to simulate NP space in polynomial time if I was really clever. I just don't see a way to do it. In other words, P space, it looks like this, but for all I know, these two categories are not only the same, but they're really the same as this. But that we don't know is true, and we think it's not true. This isn't answering your question. So maybe ask your question again, and maybe I can. I think Neil's right. The ball, the rings. The rings are bad. <laughs> so I guess I, 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 what I want to say is, yeah. well, if just this algorithm, maybe there's another one. Who cares? We have this algorithm which we know is exponential time. Absolutely, right. So, so I, that shows that there's some, that if you give me a non-deterministic p-space algorithm, that I can come up with an exponential time deterministic one that does the same thing. And because of that, I enclose the whole category of NP space inside exponential time. That's my justification for writing exponential time outside the ring here. That, that's all. Um, I still want to push things out, but that's not really what those rings are saying. The rings are saying everything's enclosed. The rings are saying that these are enclosures. We don't know if they're proper enclosures. We know that there is a difference between p and xp time. We know that. But we don't know if there's any difference between p space and p. Those might be the same. We don't know if there's a difference between np and p. Those might be the same. You can't push it out just because the way we tried ends up making it exponential time. There might be a better way to simulate this with time. I'm still confused now, right? Oh, it's a little better. A little better, OK. <laughs> We were uh -huh. talking about if you could put space and time requirements on the particular rings. Oh, uh, that's another question. And maybe that's kind of what you're getting at intuitively. And maybe it would be nice to have a class where we say it's polynomial space and it's this amount of time, simultaneous. And people have done that. And there's a lot of literature about that. And there's even complete problems for classes like that, simultaneous space and time. But that makes the picture more complicated. And, and it's kind of not really at an a first course level. So we're not really talking about any of those things. We need to do it in three dimensions like color. Oh, yeah. Good color. <laughs> Sharon, yeah. Is what you're saying that if we could prove that when we, when we make this change to determinism, we had to do it in exponential time, then, then that would sit in that exponential time? If we, if we prove that doing this simulation actually required exponential time, I don't know how we could prove that. But if we could prove that, then we would know that p space is definitely not polynomial time. We'd know that these two things, the border here, is a real border, and that these two can't collapse together. But we don't know that. For all we know, this, this, and this are all the same collapsed circle. I know they're contained in exponential time, but if I could show you for sure that you really needed exponential time, then it would spread these back out. There's still the possibility that P is powerful enough to simulate NP space. Uh, how about this? Here's our hypothetical categorization. I've convinced you that XP time can do NP space, and NP space can do P space, and P space can do P. This is enclosure is because space is always more powerful than time. Space is the number of cells you visit. Time is how many steps you take. So anything that has a number of cells visited, you know, that has a time that takes n steps, certainly has to take at least n cells. This is because it's non-deterministic, and this is deterministic. So this is more general than this. And this is because if you have something non-deterministic polynomial space, there's only so many configurations you can have. And if you just run them all through, you get exponential time. So the question is, are any of these collapsible? And I just showed you that if you give me anything here, I can simulate it here. So that collapses these two. This line just goes away. Those two are the same. 